Good evening, everyone. The mic is hot, so I guess that means we'll get started. How are you all, Lakers? Great. Good. That's what we like to hear. My name is Tim Balson. I'm currently the president of the GVSU Alumni Association Board of Directors. I get to be the host tonight. So wonderful to see all of you and the online audience. Just have a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, number one, we are time limited, one hour. We have a countdown clock, so we'll know when we hit that time and we can't go beyond it. Um, In-person audience questions here. Chris Barbie will have a microphone. He'll circulate around. We'll make sure that we get some questions in. Critical reminder, because we're broadcasting live, if they come to you, make sure Chris is there with the microphone before you start speaking. Otherwise, the online crowd won't hear you. For those of you who are watching virtually, there will be chat instructions for you to submit questions. Those will run through a chat controller and they'll be forwarded to us. We hope to get at least a handful of in-person questions and a couple of online questions submitted. Um, that's really the kind of the short ground rules, if you will. Uh, next up, just a couple moments on President Mantella's bio before we turn it over to her. Um, this is like impressive, you guys, and I'm sure when I get to the last minute, you know, a good Laker cheer would not be <laughs> underappreciated. So, officially, Philomena V. Mantella is one of higher education's leading entrepreneurs. She is a recognized leader in strategic thinking, market dynamics, and innovation in the way education is delivered. Her innovative drive comes from more than 30 years in higher education administration. She's done path-breaking work while serving as an officer at public and private universities in New York, New Jersey, Michigan, and Massachusetts. She is, of course, the fifth president of Grand Valley State University, beginning her tenure July 1. And I must interject that it's not gone unnoticed, I think. Philomena V, fifth president, yeah. we're liking that. <laughs> English majors love the alliteration. She has a PhD in college and university administration from Michigan State, master's and bachelor's degrees in social work from Syracuse University. President Mantella has spent the last 18 years at Northeastern University as Senior Vice President of Enrollment and Student Life and the Chief Executive Officer of the Lifelong Learning Network. She is known as a change agent and has had an integral role in expanding global markets and lifelong learning efforts. You're a proven leader in innovation, digital learning, and enrollment management. Personally, and over the course of the hour, we really do want to balance policy, profession, and persona, so we really get to know you. So the closing line here, uh, you've been married for 40 years to attorney Robert H. Avery. You have three sons and four grandchildren. There's some amazing words in there, strategic, innovative, leader. Where do you go from there? Shoo, I don't know, I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Excellent. I appreciate it. I, you know, I just would want to open by saying how excited I am to be here. I have um, been very careful and very thoughtful as I thought about my next move in higher education and the opportunity to lead an institution. And I am absolutely convinced that I have selected the best institution in the country, bar none, with Grand Valley State University. Yeah, we can all clap for that. And I can actually prove that statement, so I'm happy to be uh, challenged on that statement, but it's an amazing place, and it really does start with the kind of community that comes out tonight, so thank you for being here and supporting me and wanting to know me. I, I really, really appreciate it. But the people are amazing and deeply committed to this university. This university has been on a very long and successful rise. It's built and at each stage it's gotten stronger. And thank you to all of my wonderful predecessors for the work that they have done um, because they have done enormous uh, work in various chapters, uh, one, two, three, and four of this uh, university. So I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be here, and I have been deeply convinced through the process, but even more validated as I've met people and most recently met our students as they came uh, to join us. Their energy and excitement 
about being here is just um, infectious. So thank you all. I appreciate it. It would be, you know, untoward of us if we didn't spend a couple moments on policy. And if, you know, for everyone's benefit, you've been interviewed already by MLive, WGVU multiple times. You've had presidential addresses, et cetera, that are archived online. You've hit the ground running, and still there's a lot to do. So, you know, for, for the alumni constituency, how do you perhaps summarize the one or two most immediate challenges for Grand Valley State? Challenges, opportunities. Opportunities. <laughs> I think the, um, the, it, it is both a challenge and an opportunity, truly. I think that um, the demographic change in Michigan of 18 to 22 year olds, which is Grand Valley's core marketplace, um, will challenge this university and many others if we stay narrowly focused there. Um, I think we need to meet our commitment and be a public university serving the citizens of um, Michigan first, but not only. And so the opportunity to reach out uh, to a broader audience, both in um, region as well in demographics, to think about what happens after 22 in graduate work or when any of you need a um, element of education or experience, how can you come back to your university and get that in a way that fits with your life right now, which is busy, you know, raising families, building career. So I think both the challenge and opportunity is to extend GVSU's impact to new audiences mm -hmm. um, while maintaining its essence and core, which makes it special. So that's both a challenge and an opportunity. And your bio indicates you're known as a change agent. Are there noticeable, immediate changes on the horizon, especially relative to alum who, you know, hold this, the, the curriculum and the faculty and the staff so close to their hearts? Mm -hmm. Are there immediate changes or what, what are you thinking? You know, it's, it's so funny when you come into a new place because people will say, you know, what is your vision? As if I'm going to impart on a university that's 59 years of success, my vision from the East Coast. You know, here you go. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think about change as activating the talent within an organization and really freeing them to, um, to be their best self. And I start with the belief that the university is in great condition and had this incredible rise because there's great people with great talents um, and a delivering on a promise to young people. So I'm doing a lot of listening. Um, whenever I hear that someone isn't able to give it all for whatever reason, you know, trying to address some of those impediments, whether they be structural or financial or whatever. Um, and so it's really activation uh, that makes change happen and take hold. There's a lot of change theory, you know, around um, how do you think about new models? But the, the biggest thing that's worked in my career is to have one foot solidly in the essence of a place and understand who makes it run and why is it special, and then one foot solidly in the new opportunities, the futures, and let those two things sort of um, cross-fertilize one another, cross-pollinate one another. So picking up on that word futures, is. Can you describe or articulate your short-term future vision for the university? So um, I can, the way I've been articulating it is rather than to impart a vision is to talk about imperatives. You know, what does the world today require us to think about? And the first sort of imperative that I think about is how does the value we bring through this education increase more and more and more? I mentioned one thing that if, if Grand Valley State University is um, known beyond the Michigan borders, actually all your degree value goes up, right? Because you go out wherever you go in your business and in your personal lives and people know the name and they know what it stands for and what it means. So that's one aspect, you know, how do we lift the visibility of the institution? It may be how do we deepen our experiences or experiential learning, or how do we create more access for it for students who can't get the full experience because maybe they can't 
allow themselves to go on a global experience or something of that nature. So one is increasing um, the value. The second is opening up access and opportunity. So our university experience has an opportunity to impact um, students that are extremely gifted but maybe di didn't have the same opportunity, didn't have the AP courses, didn't get the college prep, you know, didn't have, I mean, I was a first generation college student. My parents had all the love and support and wanted the best for me, but they could not instruct me through a college process. I had to find my own way, and that limited my choices. So access opportunity for students of talent. I think we've got to think about digital education and its intersection with place-based education. So when I say that, and when I talk with our faculty, I say, don't think that, that what we're immediately going to do is say, Grand Valley doesn't need its campus, everything's going to be online, it's digital. But there's opportunity, uh, particularly when we're talking about adults who may access our education, for um, part of what we do. Um, we read in books, we watch PowerPoints, you know, to be delivered digitally so less time is required face-to-face and it makes it accessible to those who are working or have families or whatever. And by the way, the same undergraduates can utilize those online instruments to sure up the lecture they missed or to review it or whatever the case may be. So I think we've gotta um, forge some new territory in the, in the digital space. And, um, and then I think we have to really be mindful of our costs. And, um, this is an institution, it's almost hard to get my head around because the last institution who I felt delivered an enormously strong education did it at four times the price point that we are. And um, so for me and my own personal journey, I come here and I'm just in awe of the experience that we've created with 17% of the funding coming from the state and the price point that we're at. That said, we do need to be super mindful and responsible with um, the resources and we have to um, do a little of our own bootstrapping in terms of how we're going to create new resources because it's not going to come all out of government funds or out of student tuition. So those imperatives, those four or five imperatives is what I think I want the community to talk about and think about and then bring their best selves to the work. Over the course of this next year, we will shape a vision and a plan and a strategy. And I really want to ask the alumni to participate in it in any ways that you can. Um, and you know, it can be anything from sending me an email to coming out to sessions like this, to joining the um, boards and volunteer organizations, to talking to each other and elevating the alumni voice, um, because we all need to build this university together. You and I touched base quickly the other day on that notion of you gathering knowledge, input, data, if you will, from the alumni. And I said to you, I think that there's this sense that as, as, as much as we love Grand Valley and already are you know, loving where you want to go with us, there's still that notion of, oh my gosh, President Mantella is a university president. So if I see you at an event, is it okay to walk up and introduce <laughs> myself? And what do you want to hear from us? I, th I think we might be a little afraid of monopolizing your time or you know, being a little too brash or crass. Boy, President Mantella, why can't we do this? What, how would you like that personal relationship yeah. to evolve? I, I just want it to be an authentic one. So in whatever way you relate to people, relate to me in the same way, you know, I mean, um, it is different for me. As you read from my bio, this is my first university presidency. And even though I was CEO of an enterprise that was a very big section of what Northeastern was, it had seven global campuses, digital education, a college, 16,000 learners, a budget about the size of Grand Valley's, it is different to be the living embodiment of the university brand, you know, mm -hmm. and being the university president. And I'm learning how to do that. And I can't separate that from who I am. I am who I am as people who have come to know me a little bit. Um, so please just approach me. I, I, I welcome it. I really do welcome it. 
and understand if I move along into the event and I can't engage deeply um, every time we meet, or if I forget your name, um, help me along the way. Which brings up a point, you know, I've been mulling over for a couple of weeks here. As a university president coming in, over time you get to shape most of your cabinet, your senior leadership, maybe over time board members, but you know, the 102,000 alumni, you just kind of adopt us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get to shape you. Yeah, you, you really you know, can't, can't shape that. What's that like, realizing, wow, there's 102,000 people out there and I just adopted them? Yeah, it, <laughs> it's pretty overwhelming the way you say it. <laughs> I never quite thought of it that way. Um, no, it's exciting. It's like having a whole extension of um, the university, its affinity, uh, the love for the place. And I, you know, I use that word freely because I think that's what is here. It's like a love affair, you know, as people love this institution. And that includes the faculty, the staff, the alumni, the students as they experience it. So it's intimidating, uh, overwhelming, but, I, but it's really a joy. We vow to be kind, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, a moment ago, you, you used a phrase that I think also strikes a chord with this group. I know there are people sitting here who, like me, are first-generation college students, college graduates. I know there are a lot among the alumni base, and you described yourself in that same way. Does, does that impart or grow in you a unique kind of an empathy for those first-generation students that you're now welcoming to campus and leading in effect? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think that we all, and again, I'll, I'll think about things that I want to ask of you as we go through this conversation. And part of that is adopting a part of the university that you love, right? And it doesn't matter whether it is the computer science club, the sorority, the football team, or first generation college students. For me personally, throughout my professional life at every institution I went to. First generation college students was sort of what my passion was about. And where I made, you know, I did my work and that may have been a much broader palette um, for all students. In fact, my last decade was largely in the graduate professional space. Um, but I spent considerable time working on whether it was a new program or um, raising scholarship funding or trying to run the best um, program for first generation college students with the best results. So it, it's a, it, it definitely is a cord. And I think, you know, for those of us who have been there, we know what we had, what people saw, what they didn't see, and what we lacked. And so making visible um, the opportunity. And then we also know where we felt insecure, right? Um, and so that's just really important part of being human beings is how do you make your success and other success a mutual interest? And my message at Convocation this year was about not only reflecting on what you want to accomplish, but how can you enable others to accomplish what they want to accomplish? And how do we have a shared experience as Lakers um, that shows that we're committed not only to our self-interest, but our community interest, our friends' interest, our colleagues' interest? I'd like to hit on that point a little more deeply because I think you've got some special video in a minute that we could probably come back to. But Chris Barbie, yep. Director of Alumni Relations, does have an audience question. Hi. Hi. My name's Sam Hardenberg, 0305. I was wondering if at this point, because now I've seen you all over social media, <laughs> if you've had any standout moments with either alumni or students that like really hit you in the heart. Oh, wow. There's been so many. I, you know, there is this, it's, it's not a moment, but it's a reaction. Like when you're walking up and you just like go up to a table and you say, hi, I'm Philly Mantella. And they just, they do this like, <laughs> like where did you come from? Because they recognize you. And it's such a funny reaction. And I'll say, I'll say to them, well, can I have a selfie with you? And which they're used to reversing it, right? So we play this game. So that's my standout is sometimes the reaction I'll get when I, when I greet people individually. And as we say, I expect there was a standout moment 
at convocation. And for those of you who may have been to convocation or watched a convocation, President Mantella did want to impart her twist, her stamp on the ceremonies, which were absolutely stunning and beautiful. And it was, I believe, safe to say your first opportunity to introduce some new language, some new phrases. You, you walked into a position where <laughs> we had Laker for a lifetime yeah. and other catchphrases, and you've started something that's new and unique to you. So maybe do you want to tell us about that and we can see convocation? Yeah, too? so you have about a minute video here, but I thought it was important to share this with you. Before we kick it off, I'll just say that you know, my board chair said to me, so what do you want to accomplish at your first convocation? And I said, well, they're giving me five minutes because uh, they had the whole, you know, kind of script. And I said, well, I want to make myself accessible. And then I want to deliver a message. And then I want people to feel the emotion of being a Laker for a lifetime. And so I didn't know if I could accomplish it, but I actually left feeling pretty good. I didn't bring the video that made me accessible. Did anybody see it? Okay, so it was me trying to find my way to convocation. <laughs> Um, so that was kind of fun. And we'll just cut over to the, the very ending because I thought it was uh, really moving and important for you to see. Do, 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 do. We will call this place our home The dirt in which our roots may grow Though the storm will push and blow We will call this place our home We'll tell our stories on these walls Every year measure how it's And just like a work of art We'll tell our stories on these walls So the, um, the uh, symbolism of each member of the community welcoming the entering class, so you saw um, our faculty leadership, our student government president, an, a representative, a, a young alum, and then the last student that came up with the, you know, the hair and the t-shirt, which I just totally rocked. Yeah. She came up and accepted the wishes of the class, and then we asked everybody to join us. And the arrangement that you heard was done by our a cappella group, who um, arranged, picked the song, arranged the song, and we asked everybody to light their, you know, their cell phones. Of course, everyone had their cell phone, <laughs> you know. And um, those of us who are a little older on the stage were all like trying to find our light, you know. Um, but it, it was a really nice moment, and I've gotten a lot of, um, you know, good feedback that people sort of felt it. But we wanted Laker for a lifetime to start the moment they came in to feel that this is their home, and it is their network, and their success is intertwined with everyone's success. And that was sort of the objective. So thank you for letting it's me beautiful. share that. Fantastic. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Chris has another audience question. Okay. Hi. Hi there. My name's Christina. I'm with the Young Alumni Council in class of 2012. But I'm interested in knowing what you plan to do to continue to grow and develop as a leader yourself. So um, thank you for that question. Um, so one thing that I've always done that I've found extremely useful is to have four or five people outside of where I work that are thought partners and that push my thinking. And I try to have those individuals approach their work and their world very differently. And they're not all from higher education. And so um, it is to be vigilant to that process because it helps me process, reflect. One thing leaders do, we all know when we say we're learning, you know, we all know part of that process is reflection. It's going home from a bad day, thinking about what you did well, what you didn't do well, and really taking a moment. And when we get on these sort of racetracks, sometimes we don't do that. So it's 
that discipline. Um, the other thing is I don't see higher education industry as the domain to keep track of. I mean, some of the most interesting work in education is happening in corporate education, learning and development. You know, how are they dealing with real talent gaps today? And so it's keeping um, a reading and um, information list. I also want, a third area is, I want to be representing Grand Valley um, in places where we haven't been seen as often. So I have to be selective about that because my place is on this campus. But I'll be picking those moments where I can represent the university and what we do and how we do it um, in ways that can resonate. And, you know, I've said this, I, I, my first comment was that, you know, I think I picked the best university bar none. So therefore, with that becomes an obligation that this university shares what it does well with others. It is a competitive landscape, but we also have an obligation to lift education, and that means K-12 as well. And so I'll be looking for ways to intersect with industry, with K-12, in ways that it forces you to learn because you have to think about things differently. Obviously, we, like you, have bad days. Some we of do. us might turn to music once we get home. Music, favorite? Right, Motown. Motown? No doubt, <laughs> yeah, Motown. I can back up dance, I cannot sing. <laughs> I can do that, you know, back up dancing. And there's already been a um, uh, confirmed rumor that you have had a walk-up song already? I did. Brooks College, um, Hall of Notes, was a Hall of Notes? What's, what was the name of the song, Ricky? Uh, Philly Forget Me Not. Philly Forget Me Not. Can you believe, did you know Hall of Notes sang a song called Philly Forget Me Not? <laughs> I didn't know that. So, if, and it's a good song. They do that in Philadelphia. So, what, you know, what, again, what about the, you know, some more personal aspects? You do like music, pets? Yep, I have Lily. Uh, Lily is a white golden retriever, two years old. I can't, and I miss Lily. My husband and Lily, I only have half a family here. My husband and Lily are still in Boston <laughs> trying to sell our house and get everything, you know, ready for the rest of the family to move. I have my 92-year-old uh, mom who I moved with me. Uh, my mom and dad moved in uh, to my home four years ago. I, my dad passed two years ago. Uh, so, you know, she's excited to be here. You'll see me wheeling her around every once in a while. She doesn't hear very well. You have to speak up. She watches me a lot, though. She goes, you are so good. And I'm thinking, she couldn't hear me. <laughs> I hope she's not online right I, I now. <laughs> I was going to say, it's a terrible if, thing to reveal. If, if she's listening, I know. Or the rest of the family, <laughs> yeah. do you need to shout out to anyone yeah. in particular? Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I spend a lot of time with the kids, and even though they're away, um, you know, I, I have a practice of being involved in their lives. Like, I get these funny calls every once in a while. I'm driving down to New Jersey, and I don't know which way to go. It's like, can you tell me where you are? That might help, you know, somewhere between Boston and New Jersey. Um, and I like to work out a lot, um, so I go to the gym in the morning. Usually my, um, the folks at work, that work around me, work closest, can tell if I haven't been to the gym in a while. They go, you need to work out, you know. You need to take and get some energy out. And as Lakers will probably tell you, a long walk across campus on a February morning will do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> the wind yeah. and snow in your face. Yeah. Well, I, when I was looking at the position, it was, you know, I, of course, I always lived in the Northeast, and I was in Michigan, so I know the weather. But the polar vortex kind of threw me a little bit. <laughs> it's like, where am I? <laughs> Chris, do you have another question? Uh, my name is Emily Miller. I'm on the alumni board 2014. Hi, and my question is, being the first female president, yay, of Grand Valley, <laughs> and um, only the fifth president of Grand Valley, how are you different or how will you differentiate yourself from the other presidents? Wow. You know, um, I almost want to throw that question right back to you. Um, and the, and the, and She's the, up for it. Yeah, really. 
And the reason why is I, I almost think it's like telling people when you're in an interview, I'm good with people. You know, you're either good in the interview interacting or you're not good in the interview interacting. So I think the real truth of what my mark will be is if people are asked, what is she like? And the things that they say resonate for me, you know? So, I mean, I think that people will say I'm an inclusive leader and I, I, um, I embrace diverse voices and I like when people um, push back on ideas. I like engaging across um, sort of subject matter expertise or disciplines. I think that's where, I mean, we all know that where knowledge comes from most often is the seams of discipline. So it's like I embrace that. So I'm hoping that people feel energized. They feel as though we're building another facet of the university's expansion, if you will. It's been in physical plant, but it's going to be in intellectual energy. It's going to be in reputational lift. It's going to be in new forms of delivery. And we're going to deepen the experience for the students in the traditional way that they've moved through the university. So I'm hoping they feel included, energized, empowered, um, and that uh, I'm a person that, um, that, that, that is open to their ideas. Um, I guess that's associated with some of those characteristic and attributes when you say women leaders, you know, many of them are those words, right? More empowering, more collaborative. I, I think that's probably true in terms of my style. I think it's my gender. I don't know how you separate your gender and yourself, you know, I am a woman and I am a leader. Um, I'm proud. And I feel a sense of responsibility to do a good job because there's young women like you in the room that are saying yes, you know. Um, only 30% of the university presidents at the four-year level are women. And, um, and so I want to do that well. I've already had a couple of people, and I, I teach part-time mm -hmm. here as well. I've already had a couple of former students say that they're thrilled that Grand Valley has a woman president and have said to me, you know, unsolicited, I really think this will help young women and girls see a new kind of role model in West mm -hmm. Michigan. So do you agree with that? And, and is that an interesting pressure? Yes and yes. <laughs> I agree with it and it is an interesting pressure because you feel that obligation, you know. Um, I feel that obligation you were asking me as a first generation college student to say, you can do this, you know. I'm a university president. You can do whatever it is that you want to do. And for the same thing for women. And I, I do get approached by young women students. They'll be so excited, you know, um, to see a woman in leadership at their university. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Cool. Question, Chris. I, I just want to point out only women have asked questions. So, <laughs> men, please step up. <laughs> Hey, my name is Kelsey Kuypert. I graduated in 16 and 17, and I'm on the Young Alumni Council. So I was wondering, what ideas do you have to help alumni reconnect with the university? That's a great question. So first off is to put you to work, because <laughs> there's nothing better than engagement. So I think if we can find more and more places um, to allow alums to lead and participate, Second would be to involve alums in the conversation around the strategy going forward. I mean, I met so many people who are doing interesting work in their own business and industry and lives, and I imagine you have a great deal to contribute to the plan of the university. The third way, I think, is to do what we're doing tonight, is to embrace technology because not everyone can be here with us tonight physically, and to make this um, webcast, one that they can participate and engage in. I mean, what I tried to do with the lighting was to let the audience participate, you know. And so in some ways, the alumni engagement is participate and then make it easy to do that so that people can fit it into their lives. And another audience question coming as we wipe, get Chris around the corner. Let, let me ruin the streak of all one. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm Rob Barcelona, I'm on the Young Alumni Council as well. 
you were talking about um, getting started and, and, and things you want to build. What, one year from now, what is one thing you want to accomplish? Well, I, one year from now, I think that my imperative should um, be re-articulated as priorities. I don't think that um, we can invest everywhere, and I'm not just talking about resources, I'm talking about time, energy, talent, um, and so I would like to be able to articulate clearly the priorities uh, and have the community be able to nod and say, yes, this, this resonates. Um, I had input. Um, I agree. I disagree. Um, so that would be one thing that I would really like to do. I'd like to have a deep knowledge of the place by then. I'm still walking around and um, meeting um, people for the first time and you know I went to every college meeting and um, had an opportunity to engage with the faculty uh, but I haven't met every center I've been to two of our regional campuses I haven't gone to all of our regional campuses so I want to have a deep knowledge of the place and I want to have that energy that Grand Valley didn't have a rise and has a plateau Grand Valley has a rise um, so I want to have that energy kicked up. So priorities, energy, and um, sort of the focus and, and commitment moving forward. We'll keep the string going. Hi there. Melissa Stewart, Hi. class of 2009, and a member of the alumni board. Hi. Um, so we just talked a little bit about alumni engagement. Can you tell us a little bit of your um, alumni experience and how you stay connected with your alma mater? Yes, sure. Um, one is to really, um, I think we all connect through the affinity that we had. So one way is to continue to support first generation college students there as they come on board. And I, I helped with um, a design of some of their programs around first generation college students. The other, my husband and I met there. He was a football player at Syracuse University. And so we stay connected with that program and, um, and committed and go back for the reunions that they have as well. I did not serve on the alumni boards as, all have you, as you have done. Um, as my career sort of continued in higher education, my, my commitments got spread between those institutions that I touched. Um, so that's been sort of my, my area of focus. Chris, we have an audience question. Yes, we have a virtual question from Tristan Cot Cotter, uh, 2013 grad. What is Grand Valley doing to get recent graduates connected with work experiences to improve the school's post-grad employment rate? It's a, it's a great question. So um, I think Grand Valley's employment rate is pretty high. It's like 94 percent employed. I think that number is correct. It's pretty close if it's not exact. Um, however, that said, I think there is, I think the question is important because have all of our graduates been employed in their desired field? And I don't know that. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to try to understand employment at a deeper level than I understand it today. That placement rate alone is not sufficient at this university or any other. So one is um, how aligned with their goals, aspiration, and field. Um, the, and then the other thing that I think we need to think about is the, um, the lifetime value uh, in a career. So we can say that Grand Valley graduates were placed, but can we say they progressed at a faster rate? So I'm really interested in collecting some information and data to support going deeper in that, because I think that particularly as we face fields that are changing all the time now, the, our graduates with their liberal education and professional um, studies integration should be able to be more agile with that change. But that's also why I feel like we need to be there to support them when they need skills and competency boosts. Because, you know, when my field went to heavily analytic and driving enrollment, I needed to really understand new techniques in modeling 
um, that I hadn't learned before. So, you know, every one of us uh, will need those boosts. I have to back up a second because I saw at least one set of eyebrows go up. So your husband played football at Syracuse University. Yeah. <laughs> Should we be intimidated when we meet him? <laughs> he, he still looks pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he still looks pretty good. He's still pretty healthy. Um, no, he's not. He was a running back. And so he actually, you know, and in the way that we think of Division I today, now remember this was a number of years ago, they weren't of that size, you know. He was one of the smaller ones as a running back. Um, but uh, he's still in pretty good shape. I'm not sure what he can run a 40 in, but <laughs> probably pretty good. <laughs> okay, Chris, another online question? Yes, we have a question from Stephen Chang in Ann Arbor. As an alumni who graduated in April, what are your expectations of the student body and specifically for incoming students? Expectation of the student body. I mean, in some ways it is to um, be participating in not just an academic or intellectual journey, but in building a community. And um, as I said with the convocation, really committing to other success and then continued engagement over a lifetime. I do think that we as alums have to think about affinity more broadly. We have to think about the relationship, the things we love, the things we come back to. But as I've tried to demonstrate with some of the comments on learning, what advantage are we offering alumni when they do need to come back for more learning? You know, what could that be? What kind of membership for life from a learning perspective are we thinking about here? So um, I think there is a, a notion of membership for life. I think there's a notion of engagement. And I think there's a commitment to community. So if I may, be so bold. There's an assignment. Yeah. As, as innovative and forward thinking as I've already intuited you are, to have folks in these seats say, you know what would benefit me? Mm -hmm. I'm third career, mid career, late career, Perfect. kind of a thing. So we have some homework. We'll give you a chance to give us more homework right at the end as well. I love that homework. <laughs> yeah, that's good homework. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I, you're so easy to interview. This is just fantastic. I hope you guys are getting this energy. I, I can't let go of the sports thing just yet. Again, you're, you're walking into a university with a track record and a reputation. D do you like sports? I love sports. Any one or more in particular? And I, I also know that, that I believe the, the alumni base tries to be pretty deliberate in saying support all student athletes. Yeah. And I think we're deliberate in the use of the term student athletes as well. Perhaps um, to the benefit or the advantage of a non-D1 school. So I just give you a lot there. You sure did. Um, <laughs> I, I do think um, I love sports personally. Uh, but I also love the kinds of commitments student athletes have to make and the way they have to think about um, building their craft on the field, on the court, and the way they have to think about balancing their academics. I, too, um, really enjoy the student and student athlete. Um, I think that's really important. We're not in professional sports starting at 18. What we are trying to really do is to balance that love and passion. I love, I just came from the um, eat something wreck. So I eat something wreck. I can't remember the third. Um, but I went to all of the club sports tables, which there are like 60. I mean, that, those are amazing. It's not just intercollegiate. Those kind of students participate at a high level. Um, they just want to keep going. They don't want the same routine of intercollegiate. So I think sports and rec at all levels is really important. My, I have my personal favorites, as all of you, but I wouldn't want any of my, you know, um, Students to feel I would bias personally. I enjoy football a great deal. I enjoy rest, collegiate wrestling because I had two brothers and three sons that were all uh, competed at a high level in that sport. So I was watching that since I was like four, you know. <laughs> and um, I, I, I uh, got approached by the Taekwondo club tonight. They were like, will you come back and do Taekwondo with us? Because they knew I'd done some Taekwondo when my kids were um, kind of coming through their 
uh, I don't know, six to 16 years. I was so jealous of my husband because he was like, I'm gonna go coach baseball, I'm gonna go coach football. I couldn't do any of that. So I'm like, well, I'm gonna go do Taekwondo with the boys. And together we, uh, we all learned black belts. So that was kind of fun. And um, so that's a, that's a fun thing to do. But if you grab me exactly in the right way, I can defend myself. <laughs> Okay, I, Chris, we'll yeah. put this right over to you. <laughs> uh, Travis Cree, 2009-2011. Uh, going back to your uh, employment, uh, you, you talked about that after college. I see a strong way of doing that as emphasizing internships while in the undergrad 100%. and grad level. So how do we re-emphasize that and uh, not necessarily force but strongly encourage that at both the undergrad and grad level? I mean, I would be so bold as to say that I think there should be experiential learning in every curriculum. And um, first of all, it is pedagogically the strongest way to learn. You, you get you know, theory, you think about it, you do it. Um, in terms of making uh, people resilient and the kind of core skills that we look for, you know, things are thrown at you that you don't anticipate. They're not on a syllabus. Um, so I will be a super big fan, and when I say, you know, increase the value of the GVSU degree, in my mind, it's the more experience, the better that you put into that. And so there's lots of ways to make internships accessible. First, you have to build them. Then you have to build an infrastructure to support students' readiness coming and going to them. You have to open, we have to open our minds up to that they can be in fields other than engineering and computer science and business. And, um, and then there's a sort of the whole financial overlay to it that, um, you know, how are you gonna think about where a student might want to go or need to go to do that and what other supports. So um, I'm, again, assignment two, right? We got assignment one, now we have assignment two. Um, would be to kind of welcome your feedback on how we do grow those. I think it's an excellent question. We've got business leaders here. How do you offer them? How do you support them? How do you think about, um, you know, what have been some of the impediments to it? You've been on, you know, both sides of it. Um, love to hear it because I think it's critically important. Chris? Thank you. Hello. Dave Hi. Miller, graduated in 07 and 2010, and I'm on the alumni board as well. We met, but... Yes, we yeah. did. Good I'm to sure meet you, you met again. everybody here. Good to talk yeah. to you again. <laughs> so, um, from what you've seen so far and from conversations with students who live on and around campus particularly, what sets the student experience at Grand Valley apart from other universities in the area and other u universities of similar sizes? And what have you identified so far as opportunities for, uh, for Grand Valley to improve the student experience, particularly uh, around student safety and making sure that some students who might otherwise leave after the first semester or after the first year, uh, keeping them here, if you will? Yeah. So there's a lot in that question. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think the first thing is this sort of um, approach to that from the very first day of, and they, they picked it out in the song, and making this their home. And to me, I, I don't see other institutions that do that. And it isn't just in the rhetoric. It is, I went to the um, advising at orientation, and the way in which those conversations started at many institutions is, okay, our general education core looks like this, and you have to pick three of this, and one of this, and two of this, and this is how you fit in your major. The way it looks at Grand Valley is, what are you interested in? Where do you want to be? Um, how do you think about what you're good at? And, and, and there's this sort of real, per, what I call personalization. And um, personalization is really hard to do unless you have a culture for it. So that's what's special about Grand Valley, I think. That, even more than, I mean, the, the academics are strong, the faculty is wonderful, there's a lot of, lot of really good tangible things, but I think that's really what's, what's different about it. On the keeping students here, I think um, one of the things that people will find out about me is we can make a lot of assertions about what we know, and people can be, do it with certitude. What I'll be interested in is what you have evidence of. So rather than, um, in, the, in who's staying and who's going. 
I'm really going to look for what is the evidence around the patterns and what, what can we do to address it. And if I think about my you know, former institutional experience, because I haven't had much time to dig into this question here for just a minute, you know, there were things about the housing and how it was laid out and how it was structured and how it was offered, how it was guaranteed or not guaranteed, particularly when you're in an urban environment. You may not find it if you don't have it there. There was things about the way we, um, we offered financial aid and how it changed over time. There were students who um, were admitted with some of the best test scores you would see, but low GPAs. And they were the classic underachiever in high school. And when you add freedom of college, you usually get underachievement plus risk. And so there is real evidence that we need to you know, bring to the surface and then begin to address them one at a time. So that's the way I'm going to approach the retention. As far as student safety goes, um, it, it's again, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a culture that you want to set to have people have a responsibility for what's happening to a bystander. Um, you want to have them, if they're not behaving perfectly, but they're going to do the right thing at that moment, you want to have the policies in a way that you're not punitive if they're stepping out. Um, this is a very different environment for me, Allendale, in that um, there is such an, in <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's obvious, right? Uh, there's in such an intensity of um, students outside of university supervision in a traditional way, and there's not sort of the checks and balance of the traditional neighborhoods that, um, so I think there's a lot to just look at. How do we make those environments safe? What kind of mechanisms do we have? I'll be very interested in that. But I have to tell you, with the students being back just a week and very few meetings yet with student life, I, I have a lot to learn there. One last audience question. Yes, from Emma in Colorado Springs. She's a 2003 grad. How do you view Grand Valley's role as a teaching institution versus a research institution? Great. So um, I, I see Grand Valley as um, our provost would say we are not just a teaching institution, we are teaching and scholarship. We apply that scholarship to our teaching. And I think that's really an important distinction because we expect our faculty to keep infusing the teaching with new practices, new opportunities, new applications. Um, I think that um, in terms of research and discovery, as we are not an R1 institution, we're not chasing big grants, our primary focus is teaching and will be teaching. That said, I think Grand Valley has an opportunity in some very focused areas to make an impact in discovery. And so I would use water as an example. I mean, we sit here, you know, fresh water all around us, 20% of the world's fresh water supply, the Annis Water Institute on Lake Michigan. Um, you know, is that a place we should back off of making a deeper commitment in discovery? I don't think so, but I think we've got to focus that in a way, and it has to be applied. We're not doing theoretical research, and um, it's going to have to be supported. So again, um, the people that want us to move into these areas more deeply, whether it's the Johnson Center for Philanthropy or whether it's um, the Annis Water Institute, then we're going to need the kinds of supports um, in order to do that work and teach in those areas. Which opens up a, um, an admittedly broad, but I think important question and one I personally would love to hear your thoughts on. What about the liberal arts in the short term and maybe the long term? Mm -hmm. I do believe and you know, I've done through the years being an institution that was defined as a co-op institution. So all, all the curriculum had experiential learning in it and yet it had an integrated liberal arts core. And all of the research that we had done, and we'd done a lot uh, on um, uh, corporate interests and uh, business interests and career interests, continue to reinforce the liberal education skills as essential to the mix, whether it's critical thinking or global mindset or working in teams. 
And I think we've got to continue to push ourselves on both ends. I don't think, I don't accept the dichotomies that higher education sometimes will lay on. We have to be a liberal education institution or professional skills. I think we can, we've done that and we merge those two and I think we, did, we that false dichotomy, we can educate people for life and work. It's not an either or choice. And I think it's the same thing with can we have an incredible experience for our students who are coming of age of 18 to 22 and be able to do things for our local enterprises and adults and I think the answer is yes. The priorities within that framework, and that's where it gets to your question on focus and priorities in first year, I think are really key, or otherwise you just continue to spread yourself too thin. But um, I don't, I, so I see us um, continue to embrace our liberal education core and push ourselves further because we're going to have students even practice more frequently um, what they are learning through that liberal education core. And again, I don't want to sound like Grand Valley hasn't done any of that because they have done an incredible amount. They're, the engineering school has been integrating co-op for a very long time. Uh, there's a lot of service learning. There's a lot of internships. There's a lot of global experiences and global study. Um, so there's a lot, but there can be more. We obviously embrace lifelong learning mm -hmm. and understanding that there are folks in this room who are entrepreneurial, who have built their own businesses, who are running businesses, certainly in the online audience that's very similar. What about that notion of critical thinking once I'm no longer in the classroom? I'm an employer, I'm a business owner. What, what would you say to people who probably should understand they can't stop critical thinking because they're done with school? Your thoughts on applying critical thinking in the real world as owners, as entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, there is no doubt. It's, it's, a, it's a muscle we need to exercise over our lifetime. And I think that we've got to think about our liberal education core um, as um, what are those other elements, uh, critical thinking. I use the global framework. Most, <laughs> most of our businesses are global now. Um, entrepreneurial skills. 40% of the jobs are entrepreneurial jobs today. You know, they're basically startups. So um, there feels the top talent gaps, available fields, half of them didn't exist a decade ago. So if you think about the profoundness of that change, you know, and the skills you need to fundamentally adapt, you know, it, it it really challenges education um, to think differently, which is why I love you know, doing what I get to do. And it, means, it doesn't mean that I disregard the wonderful traditions we've had. It's just that we can open ourselves up to new opportunities. And we're down to a couple minutes, so let's let you play on that word opportunity. As I said the other day when we first met, I wanted to close with the ultimate homework and for you to have the opportunity to face-to-face -face and virtually address the alumni as, as individuals in a group, what can we do for you as individuals and as 102,000 plus adopted family members? <laughs> not to frighten you. Yeah, but. no, you're not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, yeah, I mean, help, help us, and I know you're doing this as sort of principle number one, how do you continue to broaden the engagement network? But networks, and again, are things that can be maintained and stimulated and um, activated even without us. In fact, I will say something that might be provocative. Alumni don't need us to find each other all the time, right? They don't need to go through their institution to find each other. They can do that directly. And so how can we activate, how do we make these networks come alive? How do we create virtual communities? How do we extend ourselves? How can we become a resource to one another so that the value of participating is not, I'm gonna call the alumni office so they can help me track down so-and-so, right? The value of participating is what value can we bring you as an individual and our institution together? So help, help us think about that. Help us with your creativity. Help us with your challenging questions. I mean, keep, 
pressing on things that are important for your university, our university to do. Um, and, you know, so I mean, to me, those are, those are the principles. We assigned two homework. Do you remember what they were? Not I. I'm trying to stay one step ahead of you. Hopefully they've got the homework. Do you remember all, the homework? <laughs> Anybody? Oh, see, they weren't oh, listening. Man, just... Come on, Ricky. What's the homework? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Give Ricky a microphone. <laughs> Pass the, pass, pass the microphone. We got a minute. Come on. You can do it. And Chris is running, Chris, so the pressure's on. The, the pressure's on. <laughs> okay, so Barbie has had it out for me since I started here in 2009. Uh, so internships and co-ops. Somebody whispered that to me. Yeah. I didn't come up with that yep. myself. Um, and there was another one. Own your passion, is what he said. Right. Okay. That's right. So Pick your part the of the wealth. institution that you're going to own, build, and develop, and get engaged with it. And the other is help us broaden the internship and experience opportunities for our students. And, you know, placement as well. Thank you all very much. President Mantella, thank you. Thank it's you. It's been a joy. Thank you, thank you so much.